Welcome to FACTS webinar called Greasing to Avoid Trouble. Our presenter today is Linda Coffey with NCAT and ATRA. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I'm Larissa McKenna, FACTS Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating this session. So welcome everyone, thanks for being here. Let me just take a, uh, just a quick minute to give you an introduction about FACT in case you're new to us. Uh, we are uh, Food Animal Concerns Trust, this is the, the long name. We are a national nonprofit organization. We're based out of Illinois. We do work across the country and we work to ensure, ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. We do this by, uh, we accomplish this by supporting humane farmers such as yourselves by working um, to promote policies that ensure that food from animals uh, is safe and healthy to eat. And we also help consumers make informed food choices. So I have the honor and the pleasure um, of, of directing a FACTS Humane Farming Program, which provides a number of opportunities and services for farmers, including grants, scholarships. Uh, we have some personalized and customized materials. Uh, we have a mentorship program. And of course, we have this series of webinars um, uh, on, on many fascinating topics. So I invite you to visit our website to learn all about our farmer services. And I have a, a note from someone that my audio dropped out. Is that, is that a problem for other people? Just let me know. Hopefully everyone can still hear me. Um, but at this time, uh, good, I'm getting some notes. Okay, uh, I'm truly delighted and pleased to present our and introduce our esteemed presenter, Linda Coffey. Uh, Linda is a sustainable agriculture specialist with the National uh, Center for Appropriate Technology or NCAT for short. Uh, Linda comes from a family farm in Missouri where they raised cattle, hogs, sheep, and horses, and she holds an animal, uh, a bachelor of science degree in animal science. So with her, with NSAC, she works primarily on sheep, goat, and multi-species grazing issues. And you actually might remember her. Uh, she uh, uh, provided or presented a multi-series uh, webinar um, series a couple years ago on managing internal parasites uh, uh, in, in uh, small ruminants. So I'm super, super lucky that we, she's back with us today to talk about how you can improve grazing to avoid trouble on your operation. Um, so I think with this, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Linda, so that you may, you may take it away. All right, thank you, Larissa, and thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all, and I appreciate the webinars that FACT has provided. I have enjoyed a lot of them myself. Uh, can you all hear me? I'm I good. just got a motion. Okay, so some of you can. Somebody's having an issue. I'm so sorry. Um, all right. Well, Larissa, you, you did a wonderful job introducing me, but now I would like to introduce NCAT, which is the national nonprofit that I work for, and especially the ATRA Information Service, because this is your information service, all of you. And there are several ways that you can take advantage of this service. Uh, one of those is the 800 line, which you see listed there, 800-346-9140. Um, we answer those phones from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, with regional offices across the country. My office is in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And uh, the 800 line is nice because you can call and just bounce your ideas off of us. You can ask us questions. Whoever answers the phone might not be the best person to talk with you, but they refer your question to someone who is. And I have wonderful coworkers. I'm really, really, um, really, really pleased about them. So 24-7, you can get to our website, which is atra.ncat.org. And I'd encourage you to check that out. And also, you can email any of us um, by this formula, first name, last initial at ncat.org. So take a screenshot or something and be sure to reach out to me afterwards. I have a feeling you're going to have some questions that I can't get to today. I'm happy to handle those later. So uh, I can't, there we go. I've been working for NCAT for like 20 years, but here's where I came from. 
This is my family farm in Missouri, and you've already heard we raised cattle and sheep, hogs, and horses. And I had a wonderful time growing up on this farm and really developed a love for agriculture, for nature, for seeing how things work, make a good system. My husband and I got married and we raised sheep for 10 years in Kansas. And then we moved to our current place in Prairie Grove, Arkansas. We have 50 acres, about half of that is grazable, and we raise sheep and dairy goats. Our dairy goats have always had uh, alpine and saunen, and the sheep are primarily Gulf Coast, which are parasite resistant, with a few black faced remaining. And through all those years of raising livestock, from time to time we have had some trouble. And in the polls before this started, we went through some of the kinds of trouble that you may have experienced, including internal parasites and predation, and perhaps some problems with poisonous plants. So thank you for those of you who were on and answered those polls. Thank you. That was that was very interesting. And here's some things that uh, here's some things that I thought of. Toxicity can be a thing. Sometimes some plants are are great most of the time, and then there are certain circumstances that make them toxic. So these are some examples. I'm not going to talk about metabolic problems today, although that can happen, but someone on, on asked about bloat. And so I'd be interested in people who are interested or worried about bloat, putting something in the chat about that. Maybe I'll see it um, because that's not been a big thing for me. So the next poll, I want to know which, let's see, Larissa, you have to do this. Which of these kind of possibilities of trouble are the most important on your farm? Okay, thank you for voting. That is very interesting. And it helps me too. I, I will say that your answers to these questions depended on what you're growing on your farm, you know, what kind of forages are, uh, are on your farm, and other things, the weather, what animals you're raising. A lot of you maybe have sheep and goats, and that explains the internal parasites being a big issue for you. And then, of course, the history of the land and the, um, the management. So we're going to talk about some more of these things and just realizing that what's happening on your farm is maybe not the same as what's happening on your neighbor. But for any problem that we're having, I strongly believe an ounce of prevention really is worth a pound of cure. So here are some key principles that I want us to keep in mind through the rest of this discussion. First of all, diversity of forage species really helps protect against some of these problems, and it helps boost animal intake, which also will boost their health and their production. Diversity of forage species helps soil health because different kinds of roots and root exudates is feeding the livestock below the ground. Diversity helps animal health. And if you were on the webinar last week when Kara Kroger, my coworker, talked about biodiversity and its importance, we don't even know what medicines are in some forages. So having a variety to provide, we may be providing some medicinal factor that will help boost our animals' health. Having diversity can help prevent trouble because they're not getting too much of any certain thing. And we'll talk about that more. So diversity is good and desperation is bad. And so here's another key principle. A well-nourished, fill in the blank here, is a healthier thing because good nutrition makes for a stronger immune system and a more resilient organism. So we can provide that for our animals. Um, yes, I see a question. Can I explain what I mean by desperation? Yes, I will. Um, sorry if that was cryptic. I'll show you what I mean. But a well-nourished animal is a healthier animal, right? Same thing for humans. If we do a good job with our nutrition, our immune system is boosted and we can do better. So feed the soil and that helps feed the plant, which helps feed the whole farm and the animal and the person. So these are important principles I want you to have in mind. All right, so now we're going to talk about trouble. Bloat can be a problem on some farms, depending on what kind of plants they have. So 
I usually don't have enough legumes in my pastures to make this a big risk on my farm, but I've known people who do. Here's some things you can do to prevent bloat, if that should be an issue for you. One is you can feed some, some hay first, some other high fiber forage, get something in the rumen to help um, before you put in that lush forage. Another thing, and this is big, don't put them in hungry on wet forage. So that's an example of desperation right there. If they're feeling like they're hungry and they go eat really fast, that can really increase the problems with bloat. And what we do with our lush forage is we try to um, limit graze them and move off after an hour or so until they adapt. We're thinking about the rumen microorganisms. We're helping them transition from a hay diet to more lush spring diet. And they are going to get a big load of protein in just that hour. So um, we're helping keep their, their nutrition more in balance by limit grazing. So one way that I do that when I come home from school, you know, pick up the kids, come home from school, put the animals on a strip and then bring them off in an hour or two when it's time for chores. And that's an easy way to to make the forage last longer and to reduce the risk of bloat. Here's an example of a real high legume pasture. The way we can make this less risky for animals is to have some more grasses in it. So diversity helps. What happened? What's the question? Larissa, are y'all seeing the slides okay? You're on strip green. Okay. okay. All right, good. <laughs> so bloat. Let me go back to bloat because somebody maybe is having an issue with bloat and uh, somebody can't see them, Larissa. Um, I talked to my coworkers about this because, as I said, I've not had a great deal of experience with that kind of a bloat. I have occasionally had um, an animal that would eat its supplement too fast and it would get like clogged in the throat. And for that, I'd take a flexible hose and feed it very gently, very carefully to dislodge the clog, you can think of it as, and then down into the rumen and let some air come out. And I never lost an animal. So um, it's a, a little scary when it's happening, like if they're choking. But for a bloat, for a frothy bloat, um, my friend, my coworker, Dave Scott, recommends Thera Bloat, T-H-E-R-A, B-L-O-A-T. He said this product really works well. It works much better than um, mineral oil. And he did add that it's not approved for organic. So, but Therabloat is one way to handle it. A dose of mineral oil will also help. Someone asked in the questions about beer. None of us know whether that works or not. So if you've used beer for bloat and it has worked, would you put that in the chat to help your, help your people out, please? On all the farms I've lived on, fescue has been a big forage. And I think all of you probably, if you've had fescue, you understand about the endophyte and the problems that that can cause. The endophyte makes the fescue tougher. It makes it um, more long-lived in your pasture, um, but it's not the best thing for your animals. Cattle can have some pretty severe problems. Horses can as well. With sheep and with goats, we've seen more... Um, more subtle kind of things. We don't have, for example, fescue foot where where it, the limb just atrophies, just like falls off. Um, that doesn't happen with sheep like it can with cattle. But just like with cattle, if you have an animal that's more susceptible, you can call that animal and get a stronger herd that can tolerate fescue. Here's our use in the fall, strip grazing fescue that really helps stretch out your grazing season. It's providing better nutrition than they can get from hay. They eat it better than they will hay. And they do such a good job because of their selective grazing capability of sorting out all that green, nutritious material. If you can see behind the sheep how brown it is, it's really amazing to me how they get all the green out of this pasture. And it's satisfying to do. I just move my fence just that distance. Every day, it was pretty long pasture, or maybe twice a day if I want to. And the sheep line up just like it's a feeding trough. It's really fun to do. And so strip grazing is a great way to, to help your animals out. However, because of the toxins, there can be some problems 
with their health. And so we have to be looking for that. Some years are worse than others. And we should know that toxins do decrease after frost. So that's good. And also that seems to make it more palatable after frost. Dilution is the key to preventing trouble. That is, if all they have to eat is straight up fescue, which is what I was just showing you in that slide, that's when you're more likely to have toxin issues. If you could have some legumes in your pasture, so they are ingesting something that doesn't have the endophyte in it, that can really help them to stay healthy. The problems we have seen with ours is they go ahead and they, they can have big lambs, they're healthy lambs, no problem, but they won't let down their milk. They're making milk, their bag looks fine, but you can bring them in with their babies. Their udder looks full. If you try to squirt some out, you're not going to get but a squirt or two. So that's not going to nourish the baby. And if you're not paying attention, your babies can die before you recognize what the problem is. Here's the solution. Get them off that fescue, ideally a week before lambing. Supplement them with some energy and some hay. Again, working on that nutrition and diluting the fescue and to fight out. And then talk to your vet if this happens to you about these two drugs, Domperidone, Equidome. They use these in horses because horses won't let down their milk after they've been on fescue. And that can get milk let down. It doesn't happen instantly, though. So it's always a good practice to have some frozen colostrum in your freezer for an emergency like this. Well, besides the fescue endophyte, we can have some other kind of toxicity issues, and I've listed some of them here. There could be nitrates, prussic acid, which you can get from Johnson grass after frost, grass tetany. Prevention there, don't over-fertilize, because over-fertilized pastures are the ones that tend to be problematic. For some plants like sorghums and brassicas, like turnips, after frost, if you'll stay off of them for at least a week and be careful after a drought, that, that's protection. And to prevent grass tetany, a high mag mineral. And I like to use loose mineral to make sure they consume enough, not a block, a loose mineral. The plant that you see here is Johnson grass in our pasture. And I wanted to show you, this is what it looks like after frost when it's safe to let them graze it again. So right after the frost, while it's still kind of green looking, stay away. But when it turns the color of a paper bag, um, then you can let them eat it and they will have no harm. Johnson grass is something that our animals really enjoy. They'll go to it first in the pasture. And as long as they're grazing it tall, uh, we have never had any issues. In fact, we've never had any issues because we always have them graze it while tall. Question is, if you run poultry after sheep, will that over fertilize? Well, I don't know because I don't know what your soil test says. I wouldn't worry about it on my farm because I'm pretty low, low in fertility, but it would depend on your situation and how many poultry you're talking about. Poisonous plants, if you go online and look at what plants are poisonous, it can scare you to death. I think the list of what are toxic is probably as tall as I am. Um, and I know that I have some of those plants on my farm and I bet you do as well. But mostly if the animals have been raised with them, they won't eat them. They're getting a feedback mechanism uh, when they nibble and it takes tastes bad and so they will t or maybe upsets their stomach. I don't exactly know all the mechanisms, but there's some kind of feedback and they just will not overeat most of these plants unless you force them to. Okay. So mostly they won't eat them. Um, these are perilla mint, bitter sneezeweed, silver leaf nightshade. You'll have different ones on your farm depending on on where you live. There are some that kill them too fast for them to learn. And these would include wild cherry leaves when they're wilted, peach leaves when they're wilted, and landscaping plants. So we don't throw prunings over into the pasture. Having said that, I have goats. I've seen them nibble peach leaves that maybe should have been a problem and, and it never hurt a thing. So goats have maybe a better tolerance for detoxifying some things because of their bigger livers. Um, so. So yes, I want to know what issues you've had with poisoning, and I will try to see it as you as you go up there. I saw someone say something about milkweed. The point is, I don't want you to panic about poisonous plants. And that perspective of mine is because I haven't lost animals from poisonous plants. 
So I'm interested whether you have. I see uh, wild cherry leaves, yes. Milkweed and poison parsnip, okay. All right, thanks. So here are those points to remember again. Um, perilla mint, so that's interesting. Some of you are talking about perilla mint, and I've had that on my farm all the time. And the one animal that I lost was also from perilla mint, and I don't understand why, because all of the animals had access to it. Some years they don't seem to nibble on it at all, and for some reason that animal ate too much that day. I can't keep up with this, Larissa. I hope you're able to read these. I don't know what happened, but I do think that the animal that I lost had some other issues going on. And I also noted that it was 4th of July and it was really hot and really humid. So I think there were some other factors that led to that loss. Only animal I've lost in, uh, gosh, I've been raising animals for well over 40 years. It's the only one. These principles are our friend. Dilution is good. Having a diversity of forage improves the intake and reduces the risk because dosage does make the difference, except as I said, in some like wild cherry leaves, it doesn't take much evidently. I said desperation is bad. What causes an animal to be desperate would include drought, where the plants are not regrowing like we like them to, and the only thing maybe left in the pasture when they get there are some unpalatable weeds that maybe are toxic. So that's one example. Overstocking, where your animals are taking your pasture down too low and the only thing left are those bad plants, right? And your animals are hungry. Not moving soon enough can do the same thing. We can have a farm that is stocked appropriately, but we're not rotating them soon enough. That can that can force them to eat plants that they really shouldn't. And as I said earlier, drought can bring out some toxic elements in some plants. So drought is always something to be careful of. Dosage does make a difference. Not very many of you said predation was a big deal for you. So I'm gonna skim kind of lightly over this. If predation is a problem on your farm, I'm going to point you to a wonderful series of webinars that FACT did last year, I think last year, with Jan Vorwald, Janet Vorwald Donor. It was so good. It was five parts. She goes into what, how to recognize what predator is your problem. And one of her sessions was uh, very appealing to me. It was called Troubleshooting Problem Behaviors of Livestock Guardian Dogs, something like that. Anyway, I highly recommend that series. I know we are going to send those links out to you again, but just, just wanted you to know that that series is there. Really well done. We have livestock guardians on our farm, and I need them, and I love them, and I also have trouble with them sometimes. There's an ATRA tip sheet that's very useful and concise um, called Protecting the Flock. I'm showing you the link here. If, if you can save this slide, this would be good, or we'll try to get these links into your email tomorrow. Texas has a program. Bill Costanza, or Costanzo, sometimes I mix up his name, has a, a website, a blog, a Facebook group. He does some awesome work, and they're doing some really important work on what is the best way to bond your animals to your flock. Their research shows the value of these livestock guardian dogs, and so I would recommend that you check into um, the work they're doing in Texas. And we have a wonderful podcast with Jan Donor. It's episode 169 about livestock guardian dogs. That, if you like to like listen to a podcast while you do your chores, I think you'll enjoy that one very much. Someone says, what about donkeys? Yeah, this is my donkey, Becky. And let me tell you about donkeys. It's better if you have one in with your flock. The way they work is they don't like dogs, and so they tend to be very aggressive to them, trample them, things like that. It's better to have a female or a gelding. I've heard some pretty horrible stories about male intact donkeys, Jack that is, and what damage they would do to the sheep. Pick them up by the scruff of their neck and throw them down, um, things like that. They can become aggressive. Becky was a good donkey. I really liked her. I thought she did a good job. I found a coyote trampled flat in the pasture. I had an issue with her at lambing time when I came home to find her standing over a set of twins, protecting them from their mother. So all that to say, their first lambing season can be very confusing for a guardian animal. I learned that she needed to not be in there when they were giving birth. 
had another friend tell me about their donkey that actually killed newborns. Somehow saw them as a threat, picked them up, threw them down, and made a pile of dead babies. Um, Becky was not like that at all, but it all depends. It all depends on your animal. It all depends on kind of. Uh, she was raised. Becky was raised on a farm with sheep and goats, and she she really did a good job for me. Here's the problem that I have with donkeys. She did a good job for me until she foundered. So on lush spring pasture, that is too much protein for an equine. And so that was the problem. She got a hoof abscess. I had to retire her to the neighbor's house. And I don't think I would do a donkey again. She did a great job, but I would I would really hate to go through that again. I will add that she worked well with our guardian dogs. I was worried about that first, since, as I said, they don't like canines, but they get used to the canines of their own farm. She would still be aggressive and threatening to the neighbor dogs, but she was fine with our dogs. These are not my dogs. These are on another farm, but I just put this here to say, if you have more than one dog, please pay attention to what is happening with them, especially at lambing time. As I said, that first lambing season especially is very confusing for dogs, and a couple of the dogs we've had have been a problem with their first lambing season. So you want to be watching what's going on. Having said that, livestock guardian dogs are amazing. Let me tell you an advantage of the donkey, though. I like that she stayed where I put her. And dogs don't always do that. And part of that is their their instinct to patrol, but they don't necessarily know what the borders are. And my dogs got out and bothered the neighbor's 12-year-old basset hound. This is not good. So I would, again, refer you to Jan Donor's webinars. She's really told all the story about livestock guardian dogs. And if you have a predation issue, I would encourage you to check that out. Huh. Well, how, now we're coming to the problem that some of you have identified as the big one, and that is internal parasites. And I think I think probably most of you recognize that it takes every strategy you know to stay ahead of this problem. And and I hope that you know a lot of the a lot of the strategies. I'm going to tell you some places to look for more information. So if you go to the Atra website, atra.incat.org, then look at the top bar and select topic area. Click on livestock and pasture. That will lead you to some more choices select sheep and goats, and then finally health. And that is where you'll find our library of publications, videos, blogs, podcasts to do with um, internal parasite and, and some other aspects of health, but mostly internal parasites. The webinar series that I did last year was called Managing Internal Parasites. It was three parts. If you don't have time to listen to three hours worth of teaching, I understand. I would say focus on part two where I'm talking about prevention, because I really agree, I really feel that that is where it's at. So prevention is part two, that webinar series are gonna be given a link to. And wormx.info, which is the website for the American Association for Small Ruminant Parasite, I'm, I'm sorry, American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. I'm honored to be a member of that group. So is Dave Scott and Margo Hale with NCAT. This is a wonderful group of scientists and extensionists. They're doing a lot of great work with internal parasite problems and the cutting edge techniques that you can use. You'll find all that up to the minute information on their website, multimedia things too. So um, do check that out. So here are a few slides that I put up just to like guide us through thinking about internal parasites. And the first slide is a Gulf Coast sheep and a Suffolk sheep. And the point of this picture is to just say, it is not about the breed. You will find excellent in individuals in every breed who are more able to resist parasites. You will also find some that are not. So it's up to us as breeders to select those better, stronger animals. I very much admire what the Katahdin breeders are doing in putting us so much emphasis on that and looking for uh, EBVs, figuring out which sires to select. So you may, may see the ram in the background. If you put a lot of, inf of lot of emphasis on selecting a ram or a buck, 
that is healthy and it has some resistance, that's going to help your the future of your flock. But on our farm at this time, the Gulf Coast and the Suffolk were both doing a great job for us. So finding the animals that work well on your farm, in your environment, is key to being successful. One of the ways that we know who's doing well on our farm is just like looking at their general appearance, their productivity. And another thing that we like to do is the FAMACHA test. So that's what I'm demonstrating there on the bottom right. Um, do you all know about the FAMACHA system for detecting anemia? Yes. Okay. If FAMACHA is, is a really important technique for you to know. Understand its limitations, though. It's detecting anemia, which is caused by the barber pole worm. The barber pole worm is a blood sucker. And so what anemia does, and you may know this, is makes the animal weak, makes it lethargic, takes it off feed so it doesn't want to eat, and, and the whole thing just gets worse and worse. One of the things that you see with an animal that's got an infection with barber pole worm is pale eyelids, and you measure it to this chart. That's the FAMACHA chart that I'm holding. So a healthy animal is going to have that deep rosy pink. As they get more infected with a uh, blood-sucking parasite, their eyelids will get lighter. They're, it's measuring the degree of anemia, and it's really a good system for something you can do quickly to see where your animals are as far as the barber pole infection. A couple things to know. Barber pole is most active in warm weather. It doesn't mean they're gone away, but during this time of the year, it's not a super helpful diagnostic, okay? Our, our, our barber pole worm is not likely to be very active during January. This is super helpful during the summer, and I recommend that you use it often and pay special attention to see which animals are maintaining a good, healthy, a good, healthy pink, um, because we want to keep the progeny from them. The animal on the upper right has bottle jaw. I don't know if you can really see it because the ear's kind of hiding it, but it's an accumulation of fluid under the jaw, and that is just uh, one of the kind of side effects that comes from the anemia. So, so for matcha with a light eyelid and a bottle jaw would be two symptoms you would see in an animal that's sick with barber pole worm. But there are other worms too, and so Bamacha is not the only diagnostic that we need. So the goat here, the goat here on um, on the lower part, and uh, this is uh, this is thanks to uh, my friend Dr. Jean Marie Lugenbuehl at North Carolina gave me this picture years ago, and I've used it all the time as the classic example. Here's what a sick one looks like. So I'm going to use what I call what the South Africans call the five point check. Only this is Linda's adaptation. The first thing they look at is the nose. For nose spots, but I don't really worry about that. So I'm going to look at overall appearance. And can you see that through the posture of this animal, how he's standing, how she's standing, that she doesn't feel well? So those legs tucked up under the belly is one sign. The head is kind of carried low, kind of depressed. The tail is down. And in a goat, that is not normal. So that's the general appearance, first thing to see. Um, and then we go to the eye which we're not going to show here, but I'm, I'm quite sure this animal is anemic. And I bet the ear is hiding some bottle jaw. So those are the first three. Overall appearance, the FAMACHA score, the bottle jaw. The next one is body condition. And without putting our hands on this animal, we can see it's terribly thin. You can see how the hip bones stick out. You can see the backbone sticking up above. Uh, you might also notice that the coat is rough looking. That's another indicator of health if you have a smooth coat. So um, the final point for the five point check is to look under the tail for signs of scouring. And we can see that on this tail. If you look closely, um, there's some fecal matter, which that's certainly not normal for goats. This animal fails on all the five points. This animal is very sick. And I would say that an animal that got in this condition probably has uh, internal parasites that are, are resistant to treatment. In other words, resistant to the dewormers, you probably can't help this animal. I'm thinking this animal has already been treated and it did not recover. Some of us are soft hearted and would like to try to save this animal, but if you take this animal to your home, it's going to deposit resistant parasites out onto your pasture and cause the rest of your 
block our herd to become infected. So know the signs of, of um, internal parasites. Again, I can refer you to um, the webinars and all the materials that we have. Use as many strategies as you can to prevent internal parasites. It's so much more satisfying than treating. This slide shows a few ways that you can do that. So in the upper left, diverse pasture and tall. Um, Dr. Ann Peichel says the higher the head, the lower the load. And she's talking about internal parasite larvae. Because the internal parasite larvae are deposited in the manure, they're on the ground. And as those eggs, sorry, the eggs are deposited on the ground, as the larvae hatch, they can go a short distance up the grass blade, but usually most of them are going to be in the lower part of the grass, lower two inches, maybe three inches. So when you offer animals diverse forage that is tall, you're, pro you're protecting them from picking up those larvae and becoming infected. So that's really good. Again, with diverse uh, forbs, you're going to find some medicinal factors, and so that's really good. Top right shows goats browsing. For goats, dairy goats, meat goats, it doesn't matter. Having some browse in their diet really helps keep them healthy. Again, it's keeping them away from the internal parasite larva. Again, it's having some probably medicinal factors that we don't know. And at certain times of the year, browse might be the very most nutritious thing that they can eat. So offering browse is a good strategy. Working around the clock. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Dr. Petrosamelli says chicory and plantain. There are other plants that are helpful. And chicory and plantain are two that are, that are mentioned from time to time. Cerisa lespediza is another bird's foot trefoil. Um, again, though, a variety of plants is, is protective. So moving around the clock, you see the beef animal. For sheep and goat people, if we can also keep cattle, that's really good. They do not share the same parasites. So as the cattle ingest the grass, if they pick up sheep or goat parasite larva, it just dies inside of them. Whereas if a sheep ingests the larva, that animal is going to multiply inside of them. So having a rotation, this is would be my dream. If you could put the sheep or the goats on the pasture, let them graze it to not too short. We'll talk about that, but not below six inches or four or something. Let it regrow and then follow with cattle. Let them graze it down and then move them off and let it regrow again. That gives that gives a long break for the sheep and goats to get back on it. And that would definitely help safeguard their health and keep the um, pasture more in a vegetative condition, which is more nutritious. And then finally, you see my sheep in ryegrass in the springtime getting a shot of protein. If you can boost the protein in these animals, you help them fight internal parasites. Again, offering plenty of forage uh, so that they can get full easily and not graze too short. So I really like using um, high protein forages to help my animals, especially when they're really vulnerable around lambing and kidding time. It's a smart thing to do. And this is a shot of a goat in Cerisa lespediza. I'm showing you this for a couple of reasons. Tannins, like in Cerisa lespediza, have been shown to suppress the internal parasites. They, they don't lay eggs. Um, eggs don't hatch as well from the ones that, that do get laid. Um, so it's a good strategy, but too much of a good thing is not a good thing. And we've learned that if they're only on Cerisa lespediza for too many weeks at a time, it starts to tie up some minerals in the animal and harm their health. I will also say that cattle people will look at this and think, my cows would never eat that. And you're probably right. It's certainly not at the right stage for grazing be much more palatable if it was shorter and more flexible. But things get away from us in June sometimes, and it actually got very, very tall before I let the animals in there. They still do like to eat it. What we've seen uh, reported in South Africa, and I'm, I'm intrigued by this, they offer a diverse diet by offering one pasture with, with grasses and one with Cerisa lespediza, and let the animals choose where they go. And what they observed with the dairy cattle there was if the animals went into the grass in the morning, in the afternoon, they took a little turn in through the Cerisa lespediza. I'm very intrigued by this. It seems like if the animals do have a choice, they help balance their diet themselves. 
and and I, I'm really encouraging you to offer some kind of medicinal plants to help your animals stay healthy. So this is the summary of how you protect them with grazing, okay? Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details of why this works because I'm taking too long to talk this through. But if you can move them out of an area in three days, that moves them away from those eggs hatching and they're not gonna ingest those larvae again. If you can rest an area for 40 days or more, particularly in the summer when it's hot, some of those larvae are going to die before you come back in. In contrast, if you bring them back in very quickly, the larvae have hatched and it's what I call hot, and they're gonna be more likely to ingest larvae and really multiply the problem inside the animal. So resting an area long enough is really key to, to keeping them healthy leaving behind a residue at least four to six inches tall. Again, we don't want them grazing down near the ground and the sheep want to graze down near the ground. So um, that's gonna be on us as managers to not allow that. Offering diverse forages because that boosts the nutrition, it boosts the intake, that's gonna help nourish the animal and so their immune system will work better. It also can offer some medicinal um, factors. Browse and forbs are useful. As I said, anytime you can keep their head high, you're helping keep them away from the larva. And multi species grazing really helps. Well, here's what I think is the biggest problem. I know certainly on my farm now, this is the biggest thing I have to worry about, and that's overgrazing. I think overgrazing has has uh, an impact on all the other things that we've mentioned, mm, maybe not bloat, but I think this deserves a lot of attention because it impacts our entire farm. And let's go into that a little bit. I'm sorry for all the words, but I just wanted you to see how huge this problem is because overgrazing impacts the soil in that we've got bare soil now, which can be eroded away by wind or by rain. It impacts the forages as that cow grazes them too short. Some of those forages will not recover. They will die. And by the way, those gaps there where you're seeing bare soil and where the good uh, plants are dying out, that's the opening for the weeds. That's the, that's the opportunity for these opportunistic invasive plants. It's really hard on the animals. They lose weight. They can't possibly be productive when they're not given a good nutrition and when they don't have enough to eat. It's hard on the soil organic matter. The sun is going to bake this. And there's not root exudates anymore. When they have grazed off the top, the roots have also been diminished. And so soil organic matter is going to suffer. Soil temperature is going to be high. The organisms in the soil are going to, um, to be harmed. When it rains, because there's not enough soil organic matter to absorb it like a sponge, the water will just run off. I don't know if any of you have have seen the rainfall simulator. I suspect a lot of you have the NRCS rainfall simulator. That is a powerful lesson. If you get a chance to watch that, pay attention to what they show you. I think I have a picture later. Because they are grazing close to the ground, internal parasite larvae are there and the animal is not getting enough nutrition. Overgrazing really, really makes you more prone to getting internal parasite problems. I've already said that weeds are going to take the advantage of the opportunity and the whole farm productivity will suffer and so will your profitability because you're going to have to buy some feed for this cow. You're not going to get the income that you would because your animals are not as productive. This overgrazing problem really hurts everything. And for us to have animals that are raised on a humane farm, we have to pay attention to grazing correctly so that this does not happen. So here are some of here are some of the strategies for preventing overgrazing. First of all, stock your farm appropriately. NRCS can be a real help in checking your soil types and what the productive capability is for your farm. So I really recommend that if you're new to the farm. If you're not new to the farm, just pay attention to what's happening and, and think about it. Do you have the right number of animals or are you a bit overstocked or understocked? Because that also can make management difficult. 
Always leave residual. I like to see four inches. My friend Dave says six inches is kind of minimum for him. That helps the grass uh, recover quickly. It helps it grow faster as you've got more area for photosynthesis. It helps shade the ground. It helps hold the, the moisture in your soil. So leaving residual is super important. You can't prevent overgrazing unless you have fencing that contains your animals and are able to put your animals where you want them, when you want them. So having good fencing that works for the species you have is critical. And most of all, I think we just need to pay attention. We need to really hone our observation skills and really use what we are seeing from the condition of our animals and how full they are and how alert and happy they are and how our pastures are growing back, how fast what our weed situation is, because that can be an indicator. If weeds are increasing, then we need to change our management. And our CS guy told me, you can create your own drought by your management. And I found that statement to be really impactful. When you keep enough forage covering the land, then when a rain comes, it absorbs and you get to keep it and you get the benefit of it. When you overgraze, um, that's not the case. I'm so sorry. I'm seeing things in the chat that some of you are losing sound or losing pictures. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Um, I'm hoping that you're able to watch the recording later and that it's all fine. So now I'm going to go through a few strategies that help you to recover. And one of those is stored feed. You're going to think this looks weird because clearly it's summertime. You can see the leaves on the trees. This is the growing season. But I was taught by Greg Braun and uh, let me spell his name for you, B-R-A-N-N, -N, Greg Braun. Um, the, the plants mostly will grow within 14 days of a rain event. So we'd been through a drought, and then we got a rain, and we were about to go on a, a little vacation. So we decided to put the animals in and feed some of our precious big round bales and let the pastures recover. This meant our chore person did not have to think about where to put them and for how long. We have uh, quite, a, quite a number of animals, and so we felt that it was better for our pastures to give them this time to recover um, and, and feed up this stored feed. No, nobody's lactating really or not heavily lactating. This strategy really worked out. It set us up for a good fall because things got to recover, and, and I just think this worked well. So this is one thing you can do. When your pastures are getting too short, bring the animals in and feed them. Water in every pasture really helps prevent overgrazing. It helps keep the manure where you want it. When we first got this farm and the water was only available at the barn, we were mining nutrients from the back of the farm and moving them up near the barn and creating a real problem. Too much manure near the, near the barn, too much overgrazing near the barn, and underused forages in the back, and not enough manure being deposited in the back. Don't do this. A portable water tank in every pasture is not that hard. Well, hasn't been that hard to figure out once we prioritized it. And you can move a portable water tank to a different area of your pasture. That can help even out grazing and keep your manure deposition doing what you want it to do, which is build fertility. We have really low-tech system on our farm. This is a garden hose coming from the watering point. And there's a float. And that's how we provide good, clean water in every pasture. Emergency feed, I consider my woods to be my emergency feed. If the grasses are not recovering, I can turn them into the woods and they can browse for a week or two weeks. I don't use the woods very often because it needs even more recovery time than grasses do, but um, there are some nutritious plants and having an emergency feed, whether it's the neighbor's field that you can borrow for a while or um, or the woods is a good idea. Concentrate animals so that they graze evenly and so that you move the whole flock. Really, every day is best if you can do that. But as I said, within three days, certainly move that whole big group, big, big group over because concentrating the animals evens out the grazing. It encourages them to eat a little bit of all the plants that are available, and therefore they're not leaving the unpalatable ones behind to grow and flourish and flower and become a problem. 
And then let your pastures fully rest and recover. Even if you have to feed some stored feed to allow that to happen. We're putting our animals back on the pasture when it's pretty tall. Uh, not always this tall, but again, the growing season doesn't always <laughs> the growing season doesn't always lend itself to us getting on it exactly at the right time. Um, but we're bringing our whole group back on fully recovered pastures. Uh, this is a chance for me to give a plug. Sarah Flack did an, a wonderful set of webinars for FACT. Mm, I don't know when it was, uh, maybe last year. And she goes into great detail about how to know whether they're fully recovered, uh, how to manage your pastures. I highly recommend that series. It's three parts. It's very worth your time to do. I also want to recommend the managed grazing tutorial that we have with ATRA. And I, I, I think you will find some really good um, information in that. And this is the best time of the year for you to be studying up on pasture management and how to take care of your farm so that you're going to have a great grazing season. So I'd encourage you to check into those webinars by Sarah Flack, her book called The Art and Science of Grazing and the Managed Grazing Tutorial with ATRA. Um, you will feel so much more confident when you get that um, um, information and you can stay away from trouble. And I think we just about did it, Larissa. This is the, the last slide, I think. We're about to get to the question part. I do wanna go over these resources very quickly. The Managed Grazing Tutorial. Hey, that's eight modules. Really, really well done. I didn't write any of it, so I can I can brag shamelessly. Um, my coworkers did it. There's uh, there's for someone who's starting a farm, I especially think it's great. It goes into goals and infrastructure such as fence and water and fencers, which I don't have time to go into all of that. There is one module about soil health, one about stockpiling, and one about monitoring. I think it's really, really good. So I encourage that, and it's free. And I think some of them are about an hour long. Some of them are shorter. So you could just make that one of your goals to go through one every day for the next week. You knock it out. Blog number six was called Adaptive Grazing, You Can Do It. And there is a number of videos from Dr. Alan Williams in that and some other materials. My, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Um, Lee Reinhardt, did that one. Highly recommend it. NRCS is a super useful resource. As I said earlier, they can help you know the capability of your farm. They can lead you through how to, um, uh, how to figure out where you can water most effectively and how you can fence and they can do maps for you. I love that because when you're keeping your records for your pastures or even just communicating to your uh, farming partner which pasture they're in, <laughs> Having a map with numbers on them and having some identification at the gate, I use uh, ear tags and zip ties. So we all know which is pasture number one and which is 17 and which is 22. And we don't have to argue again about which pasture did you just move them into? How long have they been there? So NRCS can help you with these maps and with lots of great information about which forages are gonna work well where you live with your soils. I highly recommend you find a grazing school, join a grazing group. Being around other people and especially being around other farms, I always learn something. I really enjoy the um, chance to talk to others about what's happening on their farm and what they have found useful. We learn a lot from each other. That book by Sarah Flack is super, The Art and Science of Grazing. And I subscribe to the On Pasture online magazine. Kathy Voth runs that. It's very diverse. It's always interesting, and I suggest you check that out. And once again, I have some awesome co-workers. You can reach the ATRA specialist and access our materials by going to our website or calling us on the 800 number. I think when we do a good job of managing our farm, we just have so much fun with it, and that is what I wish for you. So. Uh, okay, I think this is back to you, Larissa, right? Yes, let's see. I don't know if the webcam is going to pop back up. Yes. Thank you so much, Linda. That was wonderful. Um, You're welcome. You and hello, everyone. I didn't show you my face, but here I am. <laughs> 
uh, wrong way. I have to like do the opposite. This is Linda. Um, so do you want to take a minute? Well, I can I can talk to the audience if you want to scroll up at all and see what's coming in the chat that we might have missed. And I can um, also do that. But I just want to give everyone, a, let me just get through here. Oh, this was one of your slides too. Oh, yes. This is another kind of trouble. I'm not telling you how to avoid this. <laughs> <laughs> not something that was but I hope you don't have any of that trouble either. <laughs> I did hear there were there was some mud going on in, in some locations. Mm -hmm. But yes, there we yeah. have a, uh, about ten minutes or so for other questions that come in. A reminder that we are recording this webinar. Um, so uh, we'll have the slides available and a nice clean copy of this for anyone that was having issues or just that wants to watch watch or listen to it again after the fact. Um, and then we'll be sending out a bunch of resources that were listed in this webinar uh, probably tomorrow morning. Um, so yeah, we <laughs> we have a lot of folks, it sounds like. Let's see, scrolling back up. Um, I'm so sorry, Larissa, to be oh. incompetent, but how do I see the chat? Because oh. I've seen like individual things come in how do I read the whole thing? So do you see a bar, like a, kind of a column on the, the left-hand side of your screen? I do. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go to the middle tab is attendee chat. Have you seen that? Do you see that? Okay. And, and then a, what? And then it should just be a whole list of questions that maybe mm -hmm. are not. Anyways, I can, I can definitely read some off for you. I think you actually wound up... Um, you know, addressing a bunch of them during your web, during your, uh, during your presentation, there's a lot of answers you know, to questions. I, I saw some of them come through, but I know I didn't see all of them. And what what's happening now, I'm, I'm clicking on that and it's just bringing me up a box that has choices like back, forward, refresh, save as, oh. print, cast media to device. Read aloud. <laughs> Does not sound right. Um, Why don't you help me with this, please? Sure. Uh, I think, let's see, there was a question back um, in, let's see, I think it was in the either the bloat section. There's a time about, we were talking about lambing and, um, and how the milk wasn't letting down um, after, I think it was at the fescue section, right? Um, how much time after uh, shot until milk is let down? Did you find it? I did. Thank you. Okay, yes. awesome. Thank okay. you for your patience, everyone. Sure. Sorry. So what was the question? I'm sorry. Um, it was just, I think, uh, understanding more what was going on um, with the milk letdown and how much time after the shot until it is let down. That was it was like question. a day, a day or, or even 36 hours. Um, so you have to have colostrum in that baby right away. You know, it's the absorption is going to be great, great right at first, and it's going to decline gradually by 24 hours. They can't absorb it anymore, and 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 your animal's immune system is it, it's not it's not likely to to live honestly. So that's why having frozen colostrum on hand that you can thaw gently, like in warm water, you never want to microwave that, um, can keep your lambs or goats going until the mother's milk comes in. Excellent. That makes sense. Yes. Yes. So another question I think was, um, do you examine your own fecal sam samples under a microscope or do you send, do you send those out or what do you do? I do not do fecal samples. I know others who do and I, and I admire that. I, I can't even, um, I have sent some to the parasitology lab in the past, but what I got back because they were not using a McMaster's, it wasn't all that useful to me. It was more like, yes, they have parasites or no, they don't. Um, but I do know there are some, some services and it can be very helpful in deciding, is it time to uh, deworm? It can also be an indication of how much your contamination is out on your pasture. And it's really important that we try to move our animals away from that contamination. You know, um, it's, not always, it's not always clear what the fecal egg counts mean. Barber pole worms are super prolific and, excuse me, and they'll shed a lot of eggs. Other kind of worms that cause trouble maybe don't shed as many eggs. So the number can be confusing. Maybe it's a high number, but it's all barber pole worm. And those are not easy for someone to sort out which kind of worm it is. I'm told that they have to really hatch those and look at the larva. 
that's a pretty expensive process. They're doing it now in Georgia. And the beauty of this is they can tell which dewormers are effective. And so if you have a lot of sheep and you find this uh, important to know, I would encourage you to do that. Um, you know what? The name is escaping me and I know this. <laughs> But if you who have the question want to email me later, I promise you I will send you some more information. And that email again is Linda C at ncat.org. Yes, and I will I will see you on the follow up email. Oh, I think that you might I might be on your speaker phone, which is giving <laughs> feedback or your speaker. Um, there's a question: Do we lose parasite management prevention when we have one or two feeding stations through the winter season? Would you repeat that, please? Sure. Do you lose parasite management prevention when we have one or two feeding stations through the winter season? So I think what the question is saying is, are we building up a lot of contamination in one area? I would assume I have that. a feeding station. Yeah, it's a good idea to move your feed truck. My, everything we have is portable and to move it around to a different part of the farm. Um, and and when you have done your winter feeding on one area, give that a lot of rest before you're going to let your animals graze in that area. So you allow things to kind of calm back down, if that makes sense. Okay. Gotcha. Um, let's see. Another question we have. Can you provide some options for of sources for endophyte-free pasture seed? There, the person is in New York State. And the only varieties they can get are products from from Blue Seal. That sources was a question that came up last week too. Yeah, yeah. Sources of seed, and let me say, just uh, endophyte free. You know, in my environment, has not been persistent. So uh, they're recommending novel endophyte, so or friendly endophyte. It's sometimes called rather than endophyte free. The endophyte evidently lends some resilience to the plant. Mm -hmm. And of course, for us, it's a problem because the Kentucky 31, the endophyte infected, is so competitive. It's really hard to kill it out and get anything else established. But could you send me that person's contact information and me follow up later, Larissa? I will, yeah, I will try to definitely find that. Okay, yeah. let me take, man, there's a couple more questions um, that came through. Let's see, I'll take. Two more questions. I know that <laughs> there'll probably be some other opportunities for following up, Linda. Um, question from Olivia. Can this fescue and milk letdown issue happen when fescue is in hay? What type of fescue uh, or all types of fescue can they cause this, this issue? So it's the endophyte infected um, growing plant that we're seeing the issues in. My husband is a ruminant nutritionist. He says it's much decreased in the hay, which is very good news. Uh, having said that, I suppose if it was a super hot year and you had a bunch of seed heads in your hay, you know, over mature, that the toxins are going to be concentrated in those seed heads, that could be a problem as well. So if you have that happen, consider that that might be what's going on and offer some different forage for your ewes that are close up or that are in milk. We, we don't want to suppress milk production, certainly. And then the last question we'll have time for today, any direction, advice, or thoughts on grazing annuals and cover crops with small ruminants, specifically how to plug them into a vegetable farm with little, little or uh, to no perennial pasture? Mm. Good question. So we're grazing. We're grazing. Mm -hmm, we're grazing some annuals with our our sheep, and I like some things about annuals. They fill gaps in our forage plan. Some things I don't like about annuals because tillage is not good for our soil structure or orga organic matter. Having said that, you saw some pictures on here of some annuals that we have used, and I see no reason why you couldn't do the same thing as part of your rotation in the in the vegetable farm where where is that where are they located do, do you know i don't know it off the top oh he says rhode island so Ooh, rhode island mm. i have a, a colleague in the new hampshire office who would dig right into this question and would have a lot of great 
tips, I believe. Um, Andy Pressman in our New Hampshire office is a vegetable farmer who's kept livestock also. And Lee Reinhardt also would enjoy working with that environment and that question. So, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, that's actually nice fair feedback. Okay, let me just, I know we have to wrap this up. It's been an awesome webinar. Um, just a few quick housekeeping things to share. As a reminder, there is going to be a very, very quick, brief, super short survey that pops up on your screen um, as soon as I close out. If you wouldn't mind taking it, giving us your feedback, ideas for future webinars, what went right, what went wrong, all that sort of thing. Um, and you can also always email me that, that information as well, but it's, it's nice to have it in the survey format. Um, Lisa, uh, I do have one yes. more thing. Yeah, I'm looking through. I'm looking through the chat, and I'm recognizing that I didn't say something kind of important about weeds. So, oh, yes. so, so weeds have been a problem for a lot of farmers, and the best way to to work with that is to encourage a dense pasture so the weeds don't get a foothold. But once they're in there, um, sheep and goats can help in a cattle pasture because they eat things that the cattle don't. Having said that, there are some weeds that my sheep won't eat either, and so. If you if you will mow them at flowering before they set seed, that's one way to to take the weeds down. Sarah Flack points out you don't want to mow your pasture too short. You want to consider uh, that residual and that growing points. But mowing those weeds off at flowering is one way to control them. Trampling is another way. So putting a concentrated amount of animals and letting them come through and trample, moving them every day, that also helps with weed issues. I saw that someone was saying they pulled them. Yeah, I, I tried pulling my woolly croton too. Um, my husband finally spot sprayed. He said, enough of this. You're not, you're not getting ahead of the problem. So uh, a weed that they will not eat can multiply and become a problem. So uh, we can look into other things and, and people can email for more about that too. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Appreciate it. Um, well, yeah, so the, the webinar slides and recording will be available on our website and I'll be sending out the links in, in the morning time. Um, a quick plug for a couple other webinars we have coming up in February. We're gonna have a panel um, about solar grazing for sheep. And then later in the month, we're gonna have a, a wonderful presentation about the various types of resilience that um, can be attributed to pasture-based livestock production. FACT also has scholarships. We have some handouts about the nutritional benefits of pasture-raised animals that farmers can request to have customized. Um, and we uh, also links to all that kind of stuff um, in, in the email I send out tomorrow. Um, I guess, Linda, any last, any parting thoughts? Before I, close. I, just want to say, I, I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you all of you who joined and who are leaving really nice comments. Uh, I think I think there's a lot to be said <laughs> about more of these things, but luckily you have a library of webinars and more coming up. And so I thank you for providing those resources. I encourage everyone to check out the ATRA site. Call us if you need some help finding anything, because that's what we're here for. <laughs> That's right. Well, you were on the you were on the line today, right? You were staffing the yes, the hotline. <laughs> yes, I was. I even get Linda if you call. <laughs> well, on that note, I am going to wrap things up. Thank you, Linda. It's always a pleasure and an honor to have you. Hopefully, we'll have some we'll have some more sessions together in the future. Um, I'd like to thank everyone out in the audience. Thanks for sticking around. Your interest, your care, your attention to all these really important issues, and trying to you know trying to do things differently and 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 really well. We appreciate that, and um, I hope that we're all able to connect again soon. So have a great rest of your Tuesday and we will we'll talk soon. Bye everyone. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you. <laughs>